And yeah, that was a really awesome keynote. I was really excited to be here for that. Uh, so my name is Ash Dryden. I'm Ash Dryden pretty much everywhere on the internet. Um, I've been a programmer for about 13 years. I mostly do Ruby these days. Um, but I come from a very cold place. Uh, I'm from uh, Wisconsin in the United States. Um, actually, uh, this week it was negative uh, 52 degrees Celsius. So I'm very happy to be here and not freezing. Thank you for having me. Um, I actually have an interesting story about Australia. My, my aunt is actually here today, which I'm really excited about. Um, but I actually, um, I think I'm a programmer because of Australia, which is interesting. Um, when I was a young kid, uh, my aunt came to the United States. Uh, we used to go to Chicago every year for Christmas. She came to the States, uh, as she does every few years, and brought me a bunch of books about the Great Barrier Reef. And because of that, I became hugely interested in science. And I absolutely love science from that point on. I actually wanted to be a marine biologist, so I want to be a scientist from a very young age. And I ended up being a programmer, which I also love, um, but still have a very huge love for the ocean and for oceanography. So very cool for me. So what is diversity? A lot of times when we talk about diversity in tech, the conversation seems to center around women. Where are the women? And if you look around this room, you can see that the, the gender uh, ratio here isn't super great. Uh, in the keynote, it was actually kind of worse. I looked around the room, and I think I spotted maybe 15 women, um, which is kind of rough. It's, it's a rough situation to be in. Um, and the numbers have gotten slightly better over the years. Um, but I want to cover uh, a bunch of different topics about diversity, um, why we're in this situation now, what we can do about it, and what it can mean for all of us. So diversity is a lot more than gender. It's a lot more than male and female, even. There's an entire spectrum there that we ignore when we talk about, uh, when we revolve the conversation basically around women. Um, diversity specifically is the culmination of various backgrounds, experiences, and lifestyles that people bring to the table. Also important to note is that diversity is not always visible. There's a lot of things that you can't see about me that make me different from you. Um, for instance, I'm hard of hearing. That's a, a disability that I have that a lot of people can't tell by looking at me. So there's a lot of things that make us different that just looking around this room, you won't necessarily be able to tell. Some of the other things that, uh, that play into diversity are things like um, sexuality, um, ability, language. Uh, first language spoken is very important in our community. As we know, the dominant language is English. We kind of expect a lot of people in our spaces to speak English. Um, race, gender, appearance, socioeconomic class. This includes both previous socioeconomic class and the class that you sit in now. Uh, how you were able to get access to computers and the internet at an early age. Uh, what you're able to do now with the hardware that you have, if you're able to travel to conferences, that kind of thing. All of that affects the role that you're able to play in the community. So before we get too deep into it, I want to cover a few vocabulary terms just so we're all on the same page. The first one is intersectionality. Now, this is a term that uh, I kind of, um, all of my work revolves around this. This is how all of these different traits about us interact and how society treats us because of those traits. So I showed you those little bubbles before. Intersectionality is basically the pancaking effect we have of all of these different traits on top of one another. So the way that I'm treated as a white queer woman, for instance, is very different than the way a black man who's in a wheelchair would be treated. You can't separate those different identities because people see you as an entire person, and they judge you and, and treat you differently based on who that entire person is. The next one is privilege. Uh, this one is, is tough, and we've been discussing this one a lot uh, recently in our communities, and a lot of people kind of um, take offense to when we talk about privilege. Um, but privilege is just an unearned advantage that you get for being born who you are or who you appear to be. So for instance, I have quite a lot of privilege. I'm white. That means that almost anywhere in the world I can go, people will not cross the street when they see me coming. Um, people will expect me to be of a higher class, will expect me to be higher educated just because I'm white. I don't have to say anything to them. I don't have to show my credentials to them. I get that for free. So that's something that society gives me. Society does on me without my consent. So we all have different kinds of privileges. So the different kinds of things that we get for the privilege that we have, and all of us have different privileges, are things like a better education, uh, access to technology at an earlier age, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, higher pay. This is a very significant one. Worldwide, there are people that are being paid far less than other groups of people. Uh, assumed competency. People do not challenge you for what you know because of what you look like or who you appear to be. Uh, quality of the social and professional network. We know that uh, people from 
about teenage years on are, are greatly aided by the network that either their family has or the school that they're in, the people that they're able to connect with to be able to promote them and push them higher up in the ranks. You're seen as a skill set instead of traits. This is the difference between being a geek and being a geek girl. The first one you don't have to qualify because we already assume certain things about the word geek. And lastly, you easily fit into or identify with the subculture. So when we say the word geek, for instance, we assume certain things about that person. They might be somebody who likes to play video games or board games, uh, somebody who likes to program late at night. That's something that is also their hobby. They might like to play with microcontrollers. All of these things that we kind of assume about this one word. But we know just from looking around this room that all of us are very different. We all have di different hobbies, ways that we came into the industry, reasons that we love the things that we do. Stereotype threat. I think most people in the room know what a stereotype is. Uh, stereotype threat is the worry that you're going to confirm a negative stereotype that exists about you. I think the, the, way, the thing that best illustrates this is this XKCD comic, and I use this quite frequently. So on one side, you have a man talking to another man saying, wow, you suck at math. And on the other, you have a man talking to a woman saying, wow, girls suck at math. So because we have the stereotype that women aren't good at math in this instance, and if a, if a woman is unable to you know, solve some proof or whatever it is that they're documenting, um, then that confirms that stereotype. Ah, I know that women are bad at, at math because I have seen it. I have a confirmed case that a woman has been bad at math. So therefore, it must be true. So, and this puts a lot of pressure on people that have the stereotype about them. It'll actually make them perform worse. There was a study that was done um, that showed that prompting people based on their race or gender going into a test actually made them perform very differently than if they weren't. So they, they had a math test and they said, uh, you're a woman, did you know that as a woman, uh, you'll probably do a lot worse at this test than the average man would? And the woman would do worse. They would go to another control, or they would go to a control subject and say, do you, did you know that you know, you'll probably do about as well? And they would do about as well. And they would go to another one and say, did you know that women actually perform better on this test than men? And they would outperform men. So internalizing those things, it does really interesting things to us. Imposter syndrome. This is one that I, I've seen quite a few talks about uh, in open source spaces over the past few months. Imposter syndrome is this phenomenon that makes you unable to internalize any accomplishments you have. So people who have imposter syndrome might say things like, I could never apply for that job at XYZ company. I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm, I could never speak at a conference because I have nothing legitimate to say. People are, would you know, shout down me and I, and I just couldn't handle being up there and people seeing what I do wrong. Something that we do frequently in the, the area that I'm in, in the Ruby community, is we do pair programming. And a lot of people with imposter syndrome will not pair program because they cannot deal with the idea that somebody is sitting next to them, essentially watching over what they do and seeing every mistake that they make. Now, this is especially pronounced with people uh, who have negative stereotypes that exist about them, but almost everybody can suffer from imposter syndrome. And unfortunately, people who have this are less likely to apply for certain jobs, especially where competency has to be proven. Uh, they're a lot less likely to submit a talk to a conference. They're a lot less likely to, to even attend a conference. They're worried that they're going to have to perform this idea of what the person, the ideal person who's going to a conference should be. And if they don't meet that, somebody's going to find them out. They will be called out as an imposter. The last one is marginalized. Uh, marginalized person is anybody. Good timing on drinking water. A marginalized person is anybody who doesn't fit into what is considered the default group. So as a woman, I'm considered a marginalized person. So a lot of the, a lot of the decisions that are made for a conference, for instance, if we take a conference or if we take a business, um, are based on whatever the dominant group is. A lot of this is done for financial reasons, uh, uh, just makes things easier. For instance, you'll go to a lot of conferences where the only t-shirts they have are men's shaped t-shirts. So to a man, that might not be a big deal, um, but to a woman who you know, goes to a conference and says, you know, I, I would love to get a t-shirt, but all of these are either tense on me and super huge and super long, or you know, they're, they're just not really meant for somebody like me, so I feel like I don't really fit in. Um, and unfortunately, society teaches us to do this with everybody. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm different. I'm logical and I'm rational. I don't, see, I don't see people's gender. I don't see people's race. I just treat people as humans. I'm humanitarian. I love people. 
And I have a lot of people say this to me, and that, that might be true, and, and a lot of us believe this about ourselves. I like to believe this about myself, but I make these mistakes too. There was a study that was done with a bunch of scientists, and uh, they, I'm sorry, with STEM professors. Um, and they, they said, we want you to hire a new professor for your department. We're gonna give you a couple resumes, take a look at them, let us know what you think. Uh, who would be more qualified for this job? What should each person be paid? And what do you think about each one of these people from their resumes alone? They went away and they came back. And they said, okay, well we have these two resumes. Um, one for a person named John, another for a person named Jennifer. They didn't tell these professors that they were the exact same person. The only difference was the name. They slightly modified some facts, so they didn't appear to be the same, but they went to comparable universities. They had about the same amount of industry experience. They worked at uh, just as high profile places as the other did. So the exact same person, John and Jennifer. The professors came back and they said, okay, well, I think that we'll hire John. He seems really driven, he's a really good leader. Uh, he'd be a really good person to work with, really fun to work with. And I think he would push us forward in a way that uh, we haven't necessarily seen in a while. Jennifer kind of seems like she's out for herself. She's kind of a bitch, we won't lie. Uh, she's not really somebody that we would want to work with. Seems like, you know, she wouldn't fit in here. Um, and they said, okay, well, what would you pay each one of these people? And they said, well, Jennifer seems like she has less experience, so we'd probably pay her about 87% of what we pay John. Again, the exact same resume, right? Only difference is the first name. So these are people that we kind of hold up as being the most logical or most rational in, in our industry, and even they are doing this to each other. And what I didn't mention is that these professors were actually mixed gender. So there were women that were doing this to other women as well. There's nothing that excludes any of us from making these poor decisions that will look bad on us later, that'll make us feel bad, that will remove opportunity from other people. So now that we've kind of established that, how diverse is the tech industry? Well, women make up about 24%. Uh, at this conference, you've seen it's, it's quite a bit lower. Um, but for open source contributors, we're about 1.5 to 3% of all open source contributors. There are a number of things that go into that, and we'll kind of dig into that. But that can kind of give you an idea of the huge disparity that exists. So this lack of diversity, it's not just a problem in major English-speaking countries, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, places like India, 8% of CS students are women. The US is 17%. This is actually falling by about 3% every four years. The UK is 18.2, Australia is 19, France is 20, Brazil is 20, South Africa is 25. So you can see they're all kind of in the same range. And then you might be thinking, well, maybe women just aren't interested in programming. Like, we, we have to ask the hard questions here, right? Like, if they're not going for computer science degrees, maybe they're just not interested in programming. Um, but it, it's, we have to remember the history of programming too. We have to remember the history of computing. And a woman created the first programming language and the first compiler. So if we're not interested, then why did we make it? Like, seriously. There's a really great, there's a really great talk called uh, The History of Women in Computing that I would definitely recommend looking up, um, given uh, by just, uh, Jessica Suttles and Elise Worthy that is definitely worth watching kind of gives you more of an idea of what uh, the past 60 years has looked like in computing. Then you might be thinking, well, maybe women just aren't biologically predisposed to programming. You know, maybe there's something in their brains that just makes them not good at programming, not good at, you know, writing algorithms or figuring this stuff out. There's got to be, there has to be some kind of science to explain why we have this problem. But we actually do have science in the exact opposite direction. There is no physical or biological difference that shows that anybody regardless of their race or gender, is better at being a programmer. There is none. And a lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about things like evolutionary biology, which is what this question kind of hinges on, is, is the fact that you assume that there is some kind of, there is some kind of um, addition that you get to being a person for being a programmer. As if you can outrun a cheetah because you are a good programmer. That is not the case. You are not able to pass on your genes because of that. There's, there's nothing special about that. So the good news is that we know that these are purely social and cultural constructs. That means that we can change these things. It doesn't mean we have to go in and push on people's brains and figure out what's wrong with them. These are things that we can change between, the way, between how we interact, 
how we run our businesses, how we operate in our communities, uh, the kinds of words that we use, something as simple as that, the kinds of words that we use in language, um, to make this, this problem a lot less bad. So one of the countries I didn't mention before is Bulgaria. 73% of their CS students are women. And it's funny, the last couple of times I've given this talk, um, I've mentioned the fact that I'm an American, um, so I have an American high school education, and I would be hard pressed to locate Bulgaria on a map. And then in the back, yes, I know, right? Uh, and in the back, there's always like this one sad, lonely hand that goes up, and I'm like, yes, and like, I'm from Bulgaria, and I'm like, of course you are. <laughs> like, let me, let me apologize to the country of Bulgaria. Um, so yeah, so what is Bulgaria doing that 73% of the people that are graduating with computer science degrees are women? Well, they teach children from a young age that science, technology, engineering, and math aren't gendered. They're for everybody. They know that STEM is what is pushing forward every part of society today. We need everybody involved. We need everybody interested in this. And it's, also, it's a highly paid job, you know, a set of jobs. Um, it's very lucrative. Um, but it's extremely important to society. It's extremely important to what we're able to do as humans. You know, what, what we're doing in space and medicine and the way that we just teach children math or whatever is all related to what we're doing today in STEM. So we need more people. We need all different kinds of people involved here. So why does diversity matter? I'm really happy that there is a very good mix of people in here. Um, sometimes when I give this talk at conferences that are multi-track, I get like 10 women, a few people of color, some people with disabilities, and no white men. And I'm so glad that you showed up. So thank you so much. So why does diversity matter to you? Why is it important to you? I mean, it's tough, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not a woman. I'm not a person of color. I don't have any physical disabilities. I speak English as a first language. Why, why should I care about diversity? Well, how many people would like a raise today? Fewer than I expected. <laughs> you should tell me where you work. Um, so we know that in a company that has racial and gender diversity, as that di diversity increases, so do their sales revenue, uh, the number of customers they have, their market share, their profits relative to competitors. So that means more money for the company, and hopefully, depending on how much you love capitalism, more money for you. We also know that uh, diverse teams solve complex problems better and faster, which is kind of important when you're a programmer, when you are solving problems that nobody has ever had to think about before you think, um, and, and doing things that are difficult. You have to think outside the box. You're trying to push things in a direction that is more efficient, that's more productive, um, and trying to, make, you know, trying to make things better for everybody. We also know that diverse teams, um, when people are exposed to minority viewpoints, when I say minority, I don't necessarily, in the US, we say minority to mean racial minority. But when I say minority, I mean any marginalized person. Um, when, when teams are stimulated by minority viewpoints, they're more creative and more stimulated. So you're able to also, yourself, even if you might not represent any of those diverse traits, be able to think in a much more clear way in a different way. We also make better decisions and we generate more innovation. Like I said before, what we're doing today affects you know, things like the Dragon X program, right? Like we have scientists that are working on these things. We have engineers that are working on these problems. So I would love to think that we could create more diverse teams. We could have a lot more people involved in these things and do more cool stuff in space. So we know then that the financial success and viability of our industry, of our countries, of the, the things that we do, our projects, are all entirely reliant on how diverse our teams are and how we're able to include people. So it's extremely important. So why do we have a lack of diversity? Well, there are a couple different things here. Uh, the first is the pipeline, and this one is probably the one you hear get brought up the most. These are the people getting brought into the industry itself. Uh, why do we have so few people, people then coming in on that pipeline? Well, we have things like cultural cues. We give boys and girls different toys when they're children. I mean, you might have heard this a lot about the difference between boy Legos and girl Legos, right? Boy Legos, it's a bucket full of possibilities. Girl Legos, it's pink and pastel, and you can build a pet shop. Excellent. You can do this one thing. This is the, this is the number of possibilities that exist for you. So those are very gendered things. We, we teach boys to use their imaginations to be innovative, to do whatever they want. We, there are no holds on what you can do. Versus girls have a preset option. 
A lot of girls, I know I grew up with things like dolls. I can use my imagination with a doll, but at the end of the day, it is a doll. You know, it is not a spaceship. We also don't have a whole lot of famous role models to represent people that fall outside of this kind of default category. If we think of a lot of uh, famous scientists, of famous innovators, uh, famous thinkers, uh, important people in, in our industry, the vast majority of them are white men who speak English as a first language. They're most likely straight. They're most likely from an English-speaking country to begin with. So it's a very small pool of people that we're pulling from. Like I said before, there's also a difference in the access to technology at an early age. So on average, boys get their first computer about age 11. Did anybody get theirs earlier? Quite a few, OK. And for girls, it's age 14. Did any girls get theirs earlier? Three? Cool. Excellent. Um, so why is this three-year period so important, this three-year difference? Well, during uh, your puberty, puberty years, your brain is being washed with a whole new set of chemicals. Especially for girls, it is rewiring their entire brains. Things that you learn during this period are things that are most likely to stick with you. So this is why uh, learning to play the flute at you know, age 12, you probably retain that for your entire life. It's the most important time in your life to be able to learn foreign language. It's easiest to retain it. It's easiest to pick it up. So think about what the difference can be between age 11, did I go back too far? 11 and 14 for what you're doing on a computer. Being able to tear it down, being able to build it back up, building your first program, uh, totally bricking your parents' machine by mistake. Right? Important stuff. So the second area is attraction. These are uh, things that, uh, external forces that show people, oh, that might be something that's for me, something that I might be interested in. Again, here we have a lack of role models. Um, we're a lot less likely to see people representing uh, marginalized people in every single area that is visible. The tops of companies, uh, at conferences, um, innovators that you know, build things and, and go on TV and show off what they do. We also don't have a whole lot of stereotypes that reflect a wider range of people. What does a geek look like? Anybody? Like, uh, from the stereotype, what is a geek? What'd you say? Comic book guy. Comic book guy, OK, what else? Sheldon Cooper, okay. Some, a bunch of guys around a computer in a room uh, 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 doing all the teenage girls that want to learn something. Yeah, broing down and crushing code, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What, what, uh, what, what race are they? White. White, okay. What gender are they? Indian. An Indian, yes. Okay, what gender are they? Male. Male, okay. Um, how are they with the opposite sex, which they are all, always interested in? Phenomenal. What's that? <laughs> Phenomenal. Perfect. Excellent. All right, are they, are they socially awkward? Are they gregarious? Does everybody love them at a party? Like, we know that this isn't true, right? Like, we know that we're not all like this. Not every one of us fits this mold. We're not wearing suspenders. We're not Urkel. Um, you know, we know that there are as many differences between us as there are, you know, the average person, the average muggle out in the rest of the world. We know that we are, we are just as different as everybody else, but we still have the stereotype. And it exists in movies, it exists in the marketing that our companies put out about what it means to be a, a, to be a geek, what it means to be a hacker, what it means to be hardcore. We know, we market these things, we play up these things, we love this idea of what this person looks like. And I bring this up because increasing diversity is hard. It's, it's not about just, you know, maybe don't slap a woman on the ass at a conference. It's about a lot more than that. You know, there was a study that was done in a university, and they took a bunch of students that were going into a CS101 program, and they brought in somebody who met this geek stereotype. And they said, okay, this is going to be your guest lecturer, they're going to teach you. And uh, they followed these students for the rest of the semester, and they found that half of them dropped out if they didn't see that geek stereotype in themselves. So am I saying for you to not be yourself if you do meet this geek stereotype? No, not at all. But it's complicated, right? Like, we know that we like to feel like we belong. We like to feel like these are my people. I love going to conferences because I can have a conversation about anything. You know, these, these are the people that I can get along with, that they understand what I'm talking about. So if you have somebody that doesn't meet this geek stereotype, that doesn't feel like they fit in, they're thinking to themselves, OK, so I'm going to go into this industry, and I really love it, but uh, am I going to have any friends? 
Is anybody going to talk to me? Am I going to be a loser? That's a lot of things that people worry about. And this affected people regardless of their gender, whether they were male, whether they were female, as long as they didn't see that geek stereotype in themselves. They didn't, they didn't identify with that. So the third area, and the area that, or the reason that I actually got into talking about this is attrition. So these are people that are leaving the industry. This statistic scares the crap out of me. 56% of women leave tech within 10 years. Yes, exactly, super scary. This is twice the rate of men. Really scary, right? I've been in the industry for 13 years, so I feel like every day it's like a ticking time bomb. Like someday somebody's gonna be like, no, and push me out of the way, and then I'm going to become whatever else I do, looking at test tubes, right? So that's super scary for me. That means that over half of the people that get into this industry are going to have to have a second career within 10 years. How many people are over 30? All right, today you get a new job. Scary, right? Like, you, every, all of the knowledge that you've built up, all of the accolades that you have, all of the uh, noteworthiness that is about your person is gone. You are starting from the bottom rung. That's what it's like for a huge number of people. I actually tell people a lot that um, when I started researching this and, and learning more about this problem, I talked to my grandmother about what I do. And my grandmother said, you know, I'm a programmer. And I don't know why I never thought to ask her, but I was like, oh, that's pretty sweet. My grandma's a programmer, and I looked into it more. And our grandmothers actually are a lot more likely, statistically, to be programmers than our granddaughters are. That's terrifying. Like, I thought that it was pretty cool that my grandma was a programmer. It's pretty unique. And now come to find out, my, my sister just had a, a little daughter, that she's pretty unlikely to be a programmer if things keep going the way that they are. So why? Why do we have so many people that are leaving? Well, we have things like harassment. This is a huge, huge problem. I think that uh, it's impossible to go anywhere in our industry, if you are online at all, to ignore the discussions that have been going on, for the, especially for the past two years, about the epidemic of harassment that has happened at conferences, uh, online, in issue queues and open source projects, um, at businesses. It's terrifying. And I said, you know, I'm not the kind of person, I hope, that is going to harass somebody at a conference. But what about all the other people that stand on the sidelines? All the people that I hope that you're just like me that would, might see something like that or might work with somebody like that. You know, what, what would that mean to us? So I asked a question on Twitter, which was, if you were harassed at work, specifically at work, and you reported it to your supervisor or manager or whatever it was, what happened to you after that? And 25 people sent me anonymous emails, and 23 of them were fired within three months following the incident. The people who reported were. And I was like, well, that is something that we can affect, right? We are the ones that are sitting next to that person uh, every day. We are the ones that are that person's manager. We're the ones maybe that that person confides in that this is something that happened to me. So this is something we can affect. The unfortunate thing is we don't have the vocabulary to deal with this. You know, if I come up to you and I say, hey, um, so I was uh, in the break room and, uh, you know, that dude that sits next to us, he totally touched me inappropriately. What do you say to that, right? You're just like, uh, I'm sorry, and that's totally terrible. What can I do? Like, we don't have the vocabulary to deal with that. We don't know how to deal with it. It becomes uncomfortable. We don't know how to help people get through these kinds of issues to make sure that, you know, they can continue to do the work that they want to do or enjoy the, the, the community that they've always enjoyed without being ostracized, ostracized. Or the people who come forward and they report on the internet what's happened to them and they face worse harassment than they initially got. That's terrible and that has to stop and that's something that we can affect. You know, you see your friends say something terrible on Twitter, say like, hey dude, don't do that, that's not cool, it's not appropriate. It's not something that I, I expected you to do because I, I thought that you were better than that. That's something that we can affect. We know from research that people that are in marginalized groups are twice as likely to receive this kind of harassment. It's really unfortunate. There was uh, an interesting, um, I don't know if you would call it research, hypothesis that was put up in a blog post a few months ago called the Petrie Hypothesis that was taking the, the just based on the number of people in the industry, how likely you were to receive some kind of harassment. And assuming that everybody receives the exact same number of harassing 
um, remarks from somebody of the opposite gender, women are still eight times more likely to get those because women are so outnumbered. So that's a huge number of things that you're dealing with on a daily basis. Second area is discrimination. So this is outright uh, things like being paid differently, not being um, advanced in jobs, not being promoted, um, not getting job offers. Uh, men are 2.7 times more likely to be promoted to high-ranking positions, um, even though women are just as likely to meet that middle tier as men are. So there's something that's happening there as well that we're not really examining. So what can we do about this? Now that I've depressed you all and you're all looking with like your frowny eyebrows and you're like, damn, this is terrible. I'm glad that she came here to depress us all. Uh, so what can we do about it? I mean, I'm, I'm not the kind of person that's going to harass somebody, I hope. So what can I do as somebody who is a good person, trademark, that can make the situation better? Well, good news, like I said before, is this is a social and cultural problem. And all of us live in society, and all of us engage in culture. So the change starts with us. Uh, educate people who don't understand this problem. Educate people who don't. I mean, I have people tell me all the time that they don't believe that that certain people are paid less than others, uh, that they don't believe that people are being sexually harassed at conferences. I'm like, have you been on the internet before? I don't want to. I don't want to like break down all of the walls for you, but this is a really dramatic thing. So. Being able to talk to people about this, especially if it's somebody who is more like, like you, because people are actually more likely to listen to somebody that's more like them than not about these issues, because they don't feel the need to defend themselves. If I say, you know, men are far more likely to sexually harass women to a man, that puts up a lot of walls. There's a lot of offense there. But if a man is to say that, he's like, oh, yeah, that does, that does suck. You know, that's, I mean, that's because there's no offense there. Excuse me. We can get to know people that are different than us. The unfortunate part of our situation is our community is extremely homogenous, right? Like you look around this room and you can see that the vast majority of the people are visually the same. So how can we learn more? How can we empathize better with other people if we don't meet people that are different than us? So I develop, I didn't develop this actually, I use it all the time. When I go to conferences, because I'm kind of socially awkward, I'm kind of okay on stage once I get going, but I'm kind of socially awkward around people I don't know. So what I do is I pick out a color before I go to a conference, and I talk to everybody who wears that color. It's easy, right? Because I'm not discriminating against anybody based on what they look or you know, how fast they're walking or whatever it is. It's just, oh, you happen to be wearing blue? I will talk to you today. Now, like, don't do this with plaid in Portland or black at a Linux conference, <laughs> right? It's a little, it's like, it's like boss mode. <laughs> So if you're really hardcore, I would, I would suggest it. But this is a really good, good way to meet people that are different than you that you otherwise wouldn't talk to. Um, one of the things that I did when I first started doing research for this is I noticed that all of the people, almost every single person I followed on Twitter was a white man from the United States. And I was like, well, I can't exactly tell people, like, you should probably be better about this if I'm really bad at it. So um, any person that I met that was different from me, that had a different opinion from me, that seemed interesting, I would follow and just listen to them just see what they talked about. And I actually have a huge number of friends that I didn't have before that because of it, just because I wanted to do something different. And I've learned so much from it. I, I've learned how many mistakes that I have made in my life, trust me. Know that bias and discrimination are often subtle. Like I said before about privilege, we have this unearned advantage that we all get for whoever we are. And we can't see it, it's invisible to us. You don't necessarily see that uh, you get promoted more often because you're white, or that people are accepting your talk proposal for a conference because you don't have any grammatical errors because you speak English as the first language and it just comes naturally to you, right? You don't see those things. Um, there's actually this really awesome tweet that I love um, <laughs> by a man actually talking about how he deals with his privilege and, and it's, it's terrible because you're going to hurt people. You are going to hurt people's feelings. You are going to remove opportunity from other people. That's the unfortunate part of having privilege, right? That's something, that is, that is our like grain of sand that we have to carry in our pockets. It's not a huge deal, but still like, I don't wanna hurt people's feelings. I don't wanna hurt somebody. And I tell people a lot, like I make these mistakes. Like I feel like I'm probably better educated than a lot of people about these things, but I make mistakes. I went to a conference in South Carolina. It was a design and development conference. And it was interesting. Um, half the hotel was nerds at this conference, and the other half of the conference was the National Southern Baptist Conference of the United States. So 
If you can think what the difference in this hotel looked like, right? It's a bunch of white nerds who are between like uh, probably 22 and 40, and then a bunch of black people that are probably 30 plus, right? They're very well dressed. We're like in our picked it up off the floor and it smells okay best. Um, so you can see the difference, right? And I was like, wow, this, I've never seen such a, just, just a, such a stark thing in one hotel. This is an excellent display of how non-diverse we are. So there's a speaker's dinner and they have a bunch of shuttles out front and the Southern Baptist Convention also has a bunch of shuttles for something. And uh, I'm looking for the shuttle that I'm supposed to be in and I'm like walking and I'm like, okay, that one's empty so I don't know. That one's got a black woman in it so it's probably not mine. She does the exact same thing that I do. And I automatically assumed that she didn't belong where I belong. And I was t giving this talk at that conference. So it sucks and it hurts and we have these biases inside of us, but recognizing them is the first step to making it better. I hate that I did that. I hate that that is part of me. I hate that society tells me that that's a thing that we should do, but I did. And I'm trying very hard not to do it anymore. When we do these things, <laughs> You can confess it in front of a room of 50 people if you like, like I do quite regularly, or you can apologize when it happens, even if the other person doesn't recognize it. Um, and that's important because it kind of solidifies that this is a lesson I'm learning. And I tell people that apologizing, it's, you know, it's something we don't practice very often, but we should. Um, apologizing is very simple. It's three steps, just like making uh, ice cubes, if you've seen the recipe for how to make ice cubes on the internet. Yes, it exists. Please Google it. <laughs> The, which that recipe is uh, get an ice cube tray, put some water in it, and stick it in the freezer. And I was like, well, that, that makes sense. That is how you make ice. Uh, and apologizing is the same way, but we don't treat it that way. Like, it's, it's just as simple and as sensical, but we don't do this, right? So the three steps for an apology are what I did was wrong, I'm sorry, like if you say but, stop and start over because it's not an apology, right? And Try your best not to do it anymore. I mean, I make, I make mistakes all the time, and it sucks. I mean, just in the same way that we kind of like, we practice programming, we, we try and get better, you know, we, we fix our code, um, we have to do the same thing with people. We have to get better at being people. We have to practice being better people. We can talk about these issues openly. Like I said before, turn to the person next to you when they do something wrong and say, hey, that's not cool. I should actually have this on macro because I use it in, in Twitter quite frequently. Um, and it works really well, and the frowny face is imperative. Absolutely imperative, it doesn't seem like it is, but it is. Because it gives people the opportunity to save face. You're not saying, hey, you're being an asshole right now. You're giving them the opportunity to be like, oh, let me stop and check myself because I'm about to fall into a pit. Okay, did what I say was wrong? Okay, even if I didn't, like I can stop, if I don't, if I don't, even if I don't think I did something wrong, I can stop talking now and just not make the situation worse. So have those hard conversations with people. Um, like I said before, it takes a lot of education for people to come around to this. Um, people empathize by learning about the differences, by learning why people get hurt by these things. We can influence change in our communities and workplaces by talking about these things, by, by you know, engaging in this kind of conversation. We can increase uh, education and access. Like I said before, there are a lot of people that don't have access at a younger age. Um, how many people are parents? Quite a number. All right, bonus points. Uh, your kids are far more likely to go into a STEM field just because you're their parent. Like, that's bonus for you. That's, all you have to do is just show up. <laughs> um, help facilitate events for marginalized people in tech. So this might be something like um, Black Girls Code, um, Girl Develop It. Uh, there are tons of different things where you basically like, sit next to a kid and show them how to use an Arduino. Do it, it's fun. Um, volunteer at local schools and groups. Don't do this in neighborhoods that are very rich. Those kids already have access. <laughs> uh, commit financial resources if you're already giving money to uh, a university that you went to or whatever it was. Uh, consider splitting that donation and giving it to another that doesn't have the kind of funds that that has. We can work with colleges and universities to remove biases. I mean, a lot of us, how many people have CS degrees or are similar? Okay, um, how many people were happy with their CS degree? Like, you came out feeling like, yeah, I learned everything that I should know. 
All right, okay, cool. All right, so uh, like one of my complaints was, okay, I went through college and they didn't teach version control. Like I had to learn in industry what version control was, right? So there are a lot of things that we can do to influence education at a higher level. To be like, hey, you know, if I'm going to hire one of your students, this is what I expect them to know. But we can also do this when it comes to things like this, this bias that everybody has that they don't necessarily realize. There's a college called Harvey Mudd that uh, looked at the number of women they had going into, uh, going into their computer science program. And they noted that the vast majority of them dropped out of the computer science program. And they said, well, why? Like, what is happening in this first year that women are like, this is not for me. This is not something that I can see myself doing. This is not something I want to do. So they started experimenting with different things. And they found that by asking students going into this program, because they require that everybody takes a CS 101 course, asking students going into it, have you programmed before? One question, have you programmed before? And then dividing the students based on that one thing made the female students twice as likely to graduate with a computer science degree. Because they weren't sitting in class going, uh, I can't raise my hand for this. I don't know what the answer is. How does this person know everything? Am I, am I dumb? Am I really far behind? I thought this was a 101 course. Why don't I know this stuff? So that is a huge threat to people, especially, like I said, if you have that stereotype, you know, women aren't good at programming. You know, there are no women on the internet. That's a huge thing that, that affects people in a very great way. Change our workplaces. Think about what the about page of your website, your work website looks like. There's a Tumblr called 100percentmen.tumblr.com. <laughs> I have so many Tumblrs for you guys. Um, that basically shows all these companies, all these tech companies. It's like dudes, dudes, dudes. Great, awesome. But do something about that. There's also another one called um, Tech Companies Who Only Hire Men. And it's uh, a, a bunch of job ads where all of the gender pronouns are he, him, guy, dude, bro. Like, don't do that, maybe. Like, it's pretty easy. It rejects that. Fix it. Um, we can change our culture. It's a lot harder to retain good talent than it is to recruit it. Uh, think of your culture as a garden, value variety, prune weeds. Um, start doing outreach. Sponsor events that you wouldn't normally go to, uh, that a lot more marginalized people go to. Like I said before, um, <clears throat> take out all of the gender pronouns in your job ads. Um, make sure that um, any requirements that you require for a job are actually requirements. You know, don't have that litany of 50 different things that you have to know that you don't actually have to do. Um, vocally support the kinds of things that, that people are talking about to increase diversity. Talk about why it's important to you as a person who isn't directly affected by this. Change the way that you do interviewing. Um, if you have to whiteboard for your job, then sure, ask people to whiteboard in an interview, but don't otherwise. Make sure that people get paid equally. This seems like common sense to me, but it actually doesn't really ever happen. So take a look at, have, you know, have your HR department or whatever it is, analyze how people are being paid and make sure that people are being paid equally. We can start doing mentoring and career goal attainment, put people um, on a path to being what they want to be in whatever your company is. And like I said, we need everybody involved. This is something that affects all of us, even if you didn't necessarily know it before today. So I'm so glad that you all came. Um, and think about all of the stuff that we can accomplish together. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. And speak up, because I'm hard of hearing. Sure. Uh, how do other industries tackle this problem? Sure. So um, when, sure, yes, thank you. Um, so how do other industries tackle this problem? Uh, this is a problem in other industries. Um, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, computer science is actually the lowest as far as participation of women goes. Philosophy and mathematics are higher than computer science, so you should be ashamed. Um, they do it in a lot of different ways. Uh, making sure that people get paid equally is huge. Um, giving people harassment training, even if it's those really terrible black and white videos that talk about like maybe don't ask people for sex for their jobs that aren't super relevant to today. As long as people are getting those kinds of conversations and knowing that this is something that you expect them to be better, that you actually um, reprimand people when they do wrong, that is super important. I think one of the biggest problems that we have in open source today is that people behave poorly and there is nothing that we can do to stop them from doing that. We know that we rely so much on their contributions that we're not willing to risk them leaving. 
So there is no reprimand for them behaving badly. So keep that kind of stuff in mind. Make sure that people are held accountable for what they do. Uh, make sure that people are given the opportunity to learn and be better. Because I think that a lot of people, all of us in here, want to be better. We want to this to not be a problem. We don't want to see people get harassed or treated differently. So giving people the opportunity to learn. Yes? Yes. Um, and it, it kind of shakes into false expectations and proof of fail. And um, I bring my own little badge to bear in this instance. Excellent. So uh, it was more of a statement, which was there's a, a um, it's actually on GitHub, it's called Joblint, um, and allows you to run your job ads through it and make sure that there's no overt sexism or like recruiting, recruiter fails and that kind of thing. Sure. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asha.